Thank you. So welcome everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Great, thank you for the thumbs up. I am pretty excited to share this information with you today because I think it's a great opportunity to reach, it looks like a number of folks who really are involved in a lot of different aspects of land use and planning. And I think it's great to just have BATS be this other lens that you start to see things through. You probably already have a number of ways of looking at the landscape, including for lots of different wildlife species. And we have a suite of bats and bats. And oh, I'm getting a bit oh, of an okay. echo there. Let's see. Are you hearing an echo or was it just me? Oh, it looks like it, it went should away. Be it should be outside. Outside. Oh, now I hear an echo from you, but hopefully that will be done. <laughs> so I'll get started. And hopefully I'll be able to remember um, the rest of the info I'm supposed to give everyone. So if you are not already uh, muted, if you can mute your mic, or it sounds like Jens has some ability to do that. If you're having any troubles with uh, internet speed, sometimes turning your video off will help with that. And uh, I believe put questions in the chat so we can get to those later. And also if you can write your name and the town or organization that you belong to in the chat so that uh, we can see who's attending, that would be fantastic. On the agenda, I'll be talking about the biology of bats, some of the major threats, the habitat types that they use, and some of the associations with various different species, and also how that ties into land use planning, which is where Jens will get back on and talk about some of the ways that bats have come into play there. We will have some breaks and questions, so this will be divided up into a couple of sections. So if you can hold your questions till then, that would be fantastic. Our mission here is the conservation of all fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. So we are working for all of you, and uh, we're doing the best that we can to really be thinking not just from one species to the next, but in a really broader landscape scale as well, and doing activities and considering impacts that really are uh, about more than just one species. But I also deal with species that are listed as state or federally threatened or endangered. And so sometimes we do have this really intense lens on individual species, which you'll see here. Bats have a really um, important ecosystem value that's very tangible to us in that they eat a lot of insects. So they're the primary forager on nighttime insects. They can actually eat up to their entire body weight in insects every night if that's a lactating female, which is a very expensive time in their life, but typically about half their weight in insects each night during the summer in their active period. So if you think about what that would look like if you were to eat half of your weight every day, it would be quite a lot. But you don't feel guilty because you're bat, you're flying, you're burning lots of calories, and they need to put in on a ton of weight for the winter, a lot of fat that they store so that they can make it through our long winters if they're staying here to hibernate or if they fly south for the winter. And the types of insects that they eat do vary a bit between species, but there's a lot of overlap. And there are lots and lots of species of insects and groups of insects that they eat. So a colony of 150 female bats could consume as many as 90,000 insects in one night. And that's actually the typical colony size of little brown bats living in an attic or a bat house in Vermont. So that is a lot of bugs every night. And some of those are pests to us or other parts of our environment here. So this is an example of a forest pet found in New Hampshire, little brown bat droppings or guano. This was one of my colleagues over in New Hampshire doing the research. And he discovered that bats who eat these moths had evidence in their droppings. And this is actually from the forest tent caterpillar moth. So that was at 13 out of the 19 little brown bat colony sites that he studied over there in New Hampshire, just across the border. We also know that bats eat, um, or sorry, bats live a long time. This is very unusual for a small mammal, so they can live 20 to 30 years. In fact, the longest little brown bat record is 34 years from New York State. And most of these species have one young per year. This is a really rare picture of a bat that was captured while it was carrying its nursing young. Most of the time they're leaving their young behind in the roost as they go out and forage because they're so heavy. When they're born, they're already a quarter of their mom's body weight. They echolocate, which is a special 
um, feature that they use so that they can kind of see in the night. Bats actually can see, but they use this extra sense so that they can move around at really high speeds, dodge in and out of trees and hone in on very small bugs so that they're able to forage on them. They also migrate or hibernate for a large portion of the year. So that means that they're either going into underground sites where they reduce their body temperature to that of their surroundings and save energy that way, or they're going flying south as far south as Mexico or even South America so that they can go to a warmer place in the winter. So this just varies depending on the species. All of this biology is good background for understanding why they're particularly fragile at certain parts of their life stages and certain times of year. And also for understanding when a major threat comes along and it impacts the population of bats or impacts their ability to reproduce, you can see that having only one young per year means that they can't quickly bounce back from something. When we think about where bats are different times of year, this is a handy figure to sort of show right now we're in this winter hibernation period. So our cave hibernating bats have gone underground like in the photo on the left and they stay there throughout the winter when there are no bugs for them to eat. And also when the temperatures are very cold and it's hard for them to maintain some warmth using their own energy. And those other species that fly south for the winter have gone to warmer climates and that's how they make it through the winter. In the spring, they'll come out. Pregnancy is initiated because they actually stored sperm over the winter from the fall mating period. They migrate to maternity colonies, which may be your attic or a bat house, but depending on the species also could be trees or could be rocky areas for eastern small-footed bats. The pups are typically born in June or July. The gestation period usually is about 60 days for some of these species. And then they quickly, those um, young or pups have to learn how to fly and put on a bunch of fat and migrate back to those fall um, sites where then they hibernate. So with that, that gives you a basic biology background and I'd be happy to take some questions if any popped up in the chat. Hi folks, I'm Dave with Community uh, Wildlife. And uh, we're gonna have a couple breaks just like this one to read questions. Since we have a large group, um, we're gonna be reading questions right out of the chat. So if you could go ahead and enter any questions that you have into the chat, um, you can actually do that as they come up throughout the presentation. And then at these breaks, we'll read them out for Alyssa to respond to. Um, so if anyone has any questions right now, feel free to pop those in the chat. Otherwise we'll move on. There'll be ample opportunities for, for questions as the presentation goes on. All right, so I'm not seeing any immediate questions, so Alyssa, back to you for the next section. Great. You've probably heard that we have a lot of bats that are in trouble in Vermont. And when we think about what the landscape used to be, when I was growing up, I certainly remember seeing bats everywhere, just going out in my yard as a kid, seeing lots of bat activity. But then in 2008, 2009, Vermont was hit by this newly discovered fungal disease, and we in fact, didn't know what it was at the time. And that's what we now know is white nose syndrome because it was characterized by a powdery substance on bats' noses. So we saw this in our underground sites. In the winter, while bats were hibernating and in this really dormant state, the fungus would grow mostly actually on their exposed skin tissue, which is their wings and tail membrane. But when it's in its reproductive sporulating state, you would see this white powdery substance, which is kind of like little tiny mushrooms, the fungus growing on the bat's nose. And we can see those when we're looking up at bats in caves and mines, and that's where the syndrome got its name. This is caused by a fungus, and the fungus is actually able to be really, really corrosive, eating right through bat skin tissue. So this is the skin of a bat that's infected with white nose syndrome, and you can see when they come out in the spring, they try to heal that wing tissue, but this is not a normal wing. So the bat has actually sloughed off some chunks of skin tissue and it's trying to heal back and it has really large areas of scarring here. And you can imagine that if the bat has holes in its wings caused by this fungus, that that makes it very difficult to fly. So not only are they being aroused throughout the winter hibernation period far more than they normally would be when they're sick with this disease. So they're burning through fat stores and dehydrating, but also when they come out and if they have holes in their wings, they're also unable to then forage and get food and try to heal from that disease. 
In addition, we understand that the body is creating such an enormous inflammatory response that this can actually be detrimental to the bat. So essentially it's um, been uh, talked about as, as though it's very similar to an HIV infection where the body's own immune system is actually what ends up harming the bat in the end in intense infections. What this looks like on the population scale is that we've seen the total number of bats decrease really significantly. Sorry, were you saying something, David? Just checking. Nope. Uh, okay. <laughs> so the total. Okay. So the total number of bats you can see here, if you look across time at some of the sites that we have the best long-term data for, and we really only have great data on bat for a couple of decades. A couple of decades in Vermont when we've been really monitoring this species in the winter and the summer. So here are some sites from around the state. None of these are very large sites in terms of total numbers of bats. We do have other sites that had a couple tens of thousands and one with a few hundred thousand. But these are the sites where we have that long-term data and you can see a really dramatic drop off between 2009 and 2010. And that's when we saw this mass mortality. So within just a year or two of the fungus arriving in Vermont, I might just be hearing some background noise there. Somebody not unmute. So if you can mute, that would be awesome. And then you can see that over time here, over the last decade or so, a lot of these sites have stabilized, which is exciting. Some have seen slight increases. Others actually dropped to zero and have uh, disappeared. No more bats in them like the Greeley Talc mine. So some variability in terms of how the different sites are doing where bats hibernate. Some excitement. These are mostly little brown bats hibernating here. So some excitement when those populations stabilize, but you can see just how small the numbers are. It's hard to understand what these dramatic declines are like. So sometimes some photos can be helpful. This is 2009 at the large site I was mentioning that used to have a couple hundred thousand bats and is really the largest concentration of hibernating bats in all of New England. And this is a site where we would go to this same corner of the same cave because bats are choosing these little microhabitats inside. And we went back there after the declines. And this is what it looked like in 2010 in that same corner. And then 2011. This site do does still have bats, more than 10% of what the population was based on our estimates. But it, it really does show um, in pictures, what it's felt like to really experience this disease. And what we've also seen is that the disease has impacted some species more than others. Septentrionalis is the northern long-eared bat, which we see pictured here, and that species has experienced the most severe declines, 95 to 100% declines in sites across its range at this point, and the fungus has continued to spread. You can see the next one over, Lucificus, is the little brown bat, Subflavus is the tricolored bat, Sodalis is the Indiana bat, and finally over on the right is uh, the big brown bat. So you can see differences per species, and then we're showing with the color blocks here from left to right in each of those species, the, the change in the population when the um, invasion of the fungus happened, and then as the disease became an epidemic and a lot of bats were dying, and then once it was established what that overall population loss has looked like. When we think about the nine species of bats that we have here in Vermont, I mentioned early on that we think of those bats that stay and hibernate for the winter as kind of cave bats, the ones that go out of state and fly south and use a different strategy, to, strategy make to make the winter are called migratory, called migratory tree migratory. bats. And those migratory tree bats are three species that do not hibernate, and so they do not appear to be affected by the disease, whereas the species on the left there, the cave bats, are the ones that are affected by white nose syndrome. And as you can see, we had the Indiana bat was federally endangered already since the 1960s. And in yellow there, the eastern small-footed bat was state-threatened for a few decades in Vermont already. But the three circled in green are species that were added just because of severe declines from white nose syndrome. And then the northern long-eared bat then became federally threatened and is now federally endangered. The tricolored bat has also been um, proposed as federally endangered, and we're waiting for a listing decision from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on them. So here's a nice close-up of the tricolored bat. This is a bat that 
we rarely find in the summer in Vermont, but we see them just a couple here and there in underground sites. And that's where we've been focusing our protection for the species. In terms of this disease and what that spread has looked like, if you look at the X over in New York State, you can see that that's where it was first documented. And then if you look at the color scale in the figure, you can see that the lighter um, white and then going through to the dark blue is showing the progression of that disease as it spread from that epicenter and then moved out and went down the Appalachian Mountains up into Canada. And then it's uh, moved across the west more recently in the yellow and, and uh, orange and red. And it's now confirmed in 12 different bat species in 40 states and eight Canadian provinces, with a few additional species states and provinces where the fungus has been found, but we haven't yet confirmed the disease itself. But there are some signs of hope, though so not to be totally, <laughs> totally sad in this presentation. We've been watching not only populations of bats, but individual bats. And we do that by putting these arm bands on. So this is on their forearm. You can see some of those metal bands so that we're able to track individuals by recapturing them or reciting them in underground sites and trying to understand were there any differences between male and female survival? Are young being recruited into the population? Why are individuals surviving? And we've seen a number of really interesting trends. One of those is the fat bat hypothesis. So we found support for the fact that the, after the bottleneck of the declines from white nose syndrome, that bats who were fatter going into hibernation, um, maybe the ones that are surviving, and the average little brown bat is fatter going into hibernation now. So that was support for that theory. We have individuals, in fact, in Vermont who have survived up to 19 years through the disease. That means we have recaptured them that um, recaptured individuals that have made it through the entire period white nose syndrome has been here. And those individuals are in fact going underground where the fungus remains. They're being exposed to the disease and getting sick each winter, but somehow they are very resilient and they're able to make it through, heal in the spring and then face that disease again. But why is that? So we're looking at a number of different things with lots of research partners from places like Rutgers and Virginia Tech. So we help them collect samples and look at individual bats and populations to try to understand is there actual resistance, which may be what's going on with the big brown bat and they're not really getting sick or seeing population declines that are severe, or is there resilience, which appears to be what we're seeing with little brown bats that they get sick, such as the figure over on the right here, this is the same bat in figure A as down in figure B. The difference is that the bat in figure A was captured in May. And then when that same bat was recaptured at the end of the summer, you can see in figure B where the red circle highlights how much wing tissue has regrown. So amazingly, these bats are able to heal. They're able to regrow wing tissue. Um, we can only see uh, barely visible signs of scarring by the late summer, which is really incredible, but obviously not all of them make it through that. We also have been investigating this idea of tolerance, that essentially they're sort of living with this illness and maybe they're not getting sick enough from the disease, so they're able to eke out the winter. And, um, and we're looking at what the role of habitat conservation is in that. Why are bats doing better at some sites that seem to be well protected? So this is a good spot for us to take another break now that we've talked about one of the major threats to the species. All right, Alyssa, so we've got a couple of questions that came up during this last section, and we're gonna start with Tori. Hi, Tori. Um, the question is on the mechanics of your work. So what techniques do you use to monitor bats and are there easy foolproof methods to monitor them? <laughs> I probably wouldn't call anything too easy and foolproof with the exception of collecting reports from the public. I would say that is the easiest one. So people do tell us when they have bats in their houses, and that's been actually a growing way for us to collect information on bats around the state, specifically the bats that roost in people's buildings in the summer. So we have a couple thousand of those reports now. And last I checked, I think 640 of those locations we had confidently identified to species, mostly as big brown or little brown bats. So reporting from the public with photos, with bat droppings, with um, other information about the colonies has been extremely helpful and it saves us a lot of effort for those two species. 
Most of the other species, we have to do things like mist netting, where we go out and set up nets and stay up until three or four in the morning and try to capture bats. And that can be really fun and exciting, but actually really boring these days because there's so little bat activity on the landscape, especially when we're looking for those threatened and endangered species. So sometimes we'll come up empty handed and have captured zero bats. If we do capture our bats in question, we use radio telemetry to track them back to roost. And that's how we find out the trees that they use, the cliffs and talus areas that they use. We also do a lot of acoustic surveys and that's putting out listening devices that we'll leave in place or listening devices on the top of a car to drive an acoustic route. And that allows us to collect information on any of the species that might be flying in the air in an area. And some of those are places that we'll survey year after year for a North American monitoring project to see what changes happen. And others are places where um, it the survey might happen and be done by a consultant prior to a land conversion like Act 250 or an energy production project. And they also could be done prior to our own forest management or wildlife habitat management on our state lands. So those those are the major ways that we learn about bats. Great. Uh, so Mike would like to know, are there accessible places to find this data that you're sharing for communicating to the public? Ah, I guess it depends on what um, type of data. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to get better at um, putting some of this information out to the public. Uh, right now, mostly it's coming through our presentations. We do have a report that I create each year about um, those maternity colonies, bats that are living in buildings, and those are monitored over the summer by a lot of volunteers. And that's something that I'm hoping we'll put up on our website soon. Right. OK, so next question um, from Maggie. Uh, Maggie is wondering if there's a good estimate of current numbers in total. So uh, if the trends that are showing are just based on representative sampling. Is there a, a estimate of the total numbers by species? Yes, that, that is a great question, Maggie, and that's a really hard one to get at. Um, even uh, federally or other states, it's bats because they move around so much and we think we only know of maybe a, a fraction, but we're not sure what that fraction is, of the number of sites that are out there. It's hard for us to get at total numbers. What I can say is that um, historically, we we expected that we had maybe um, half a million hibernating bats in Vermont just at our at our known sites. So I don't know how many places we don't know about hibernate about bats hibernating underground, but that was at our known sites. And then after white nose syndrome, about ten percent of that. Great. So we've got a couple more. Um, uh, definitely, I know Jens is pretty good at monitoring us for time, so feel free to um, Jens uh, pause us if we need to move on to the next section. But the next two are actually overlapping. They're asking about the same thing. Um, so this question here is, um, so are the bats that are showing resistance um, who are surviving white nose syndrome, are they surviving but having reduced fertility when they survive, or are they still able to reproduce after they fight off the infection and survive? Yes, that is a fantastic question and one that we were wondering as well. So there's a researcher, Catherine Ionison, who I don't think has gotten a chance to publish this yet, but has shared it at a few meetings, that she studied um, little brown bat maternity colonies where she captured individuals and juveniles and looked at them in comparison to older data from New Hampshire with colonies that have been studied. So she was able to monitor colonies in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts and she observed that uh, not only was the reproductive rate not affected in a negative way from white nose, but she actually found that it appeared the reproductive success may be higher after white nose. And specifically that young of the year, females born that, um, and going into hibernation their first year normally don't um, don't mate that fall, it, but occasionally do. And she found that that rate was actually higher after white nose. So it appears that more young females are mating their first year. So we were not seeing a negative impact for reproductive success, which was really, really exciting. Amazing. So I think we can slip in just this last question um, and then we'll cut it off to move on. So the last question is, are the insect species that the bats eat currently in decline? Um, uh, as an important food source for bats, and should we be concerned in the short term? 
That's a great question and one that I'm not the expert on. I reached out to a number of entomologists when white nose syndrome was in its earlier stages. And a lot of us had that question of um, if you lose such a large portion of the predators, do you see insect numbers change and populations change? And the response I got was essentially along the lines of insect populations are sensitive to so many other environmental factors as simple as is it a wet year or is it a dry year that it was really difficult to um, draw that correlation. What I can tell you is that these bats forage on a huge variety of night flying insects and we only within the last five years or so have gotten a handle on what a lot of the particular species are because people used to pick through bat guano and identify maybe the order it's coleoptera um, or down to the genus level, but not necessarily the species level because they were looking at insect parts in bat guano. Now that we have these molecular tools, people can look at guano and find the exact species. So I think we're going to be able to answer more of those questions. But for right now, I think the biggest benefit of understanding specific insects that bats eat is that they could be early detectors for invasive insect species that are going to show up in an area that may appear in bat guano before we really see a lot of them on the landscape. Great. So we still have some questions coming coming in, but I'm going to pause it there uh, for time and we're going to move on to the next section. Um, please feel free to continue putting your questions in and we'll we'll queue them up for the next break. Great. So what habitat is important for bats? And we can break this down into a few different types. Maternity colony habitat, that's where the females gather and raise their young. Hibernacula habitat, where our cave bats go for the winter. Foraging habitat, which consists of a lot of different um, types of forest stands, edges, over water, wetlands, the fresh water itself where bats have to dip down and drink, and connectivity between those different elements. When we look at some examples, you can see that the trees that a lot of these species use tend to be the larger diameter trees on the landscape. They also, depending on the species, will use talus cliffs and quarries, such as the big brown bat, eastern small footed bat, and even the northern long eared bats sometimes, and human structures, as with the case of little brown and big brown bats. Um, and then we're, we'll talk a little bit about these foraging areas, the safe travel corridors, and the fresh water that they need to have nearby. So, all of these elements for good maternity colony habitat usually are located within a couple mile radius for most of these species in their maternity colony habitat. So we'll see that there's actually a big concentration of our a lot of our threatened and endangered species down in the warm Champlain Valley area or over in the Connecticut River Valley area because those are places where we'll see water and uh, a mix of edge with fields and forest and things like that all in that matrix connected together. So bats are using these live, dead, or dying trees that just happen to have the right features. And oftentimes, with the exception of the Indiana bat that really does love shagbark hickories over on the left there, most of these species are just picking trees that happen to have the right feature no matter what the species of tree is. So on the right here, you can see a cavity, and that's something that's really a favored feature for northern long-eared bats, but also silver-haired bats, big brown bats, and little brown bats are some of the species that tend to gravitate towards cavities. And bats are really highly vulnerable when they're in these features. So we do a lot during land use planning to advise people on how to avoid cutting any of these types of trees down with these features during the spring through fall when bats could be roosting in them because you could have a lot of bats roosting in them. I mentioned a typical colony size, maybe about 150 bats but that can range up to, I think 600 bats is about the largest little brown bat colony we have right now. And we found Indiana bats in Vermont roosting in colonies up to about 350 bats in a single roost. So that makes them really highly vulnerable at that time. Some of the bats like to have more open solar exposed roosts on the left there you can see, whereas other bats prefer to be suppressed in the canopy in sort of a darker lower roost location. So it can vary by species. This is a picture of an Indiana bat tucked up under the bark there. And the bat's about the size of your thumb. The hibernate Hibernacula, or those, those caves and mine locations, are almost exclusively on private land. So we really rely on private landowners to help us conserve that habitat. 
sometimes those are abandoned mines like the um, EPA sites that are undergoing restoration on the eastern side of the state, old copper mines. Some of them are very, very tiny sites that I can barely squeeze into the opening of, and others are really large sites you can walk into. So it's really important that we do keep the trees that are right around that site and the other vegetation, because that actually protects the airflow going in and out of the site, the temperature of the site, so that bats have those stable environments underground that they've really chosen for the um, perfect way to make it through the winter. So it's not all caves and mines have those features. The foraging habitat can include things like forest edges, can be along open water, wetlands, fields, um, small forest openings, even if you're doing some management on your land where you're cutting a couple trees out, just um, picking a few trees out and making some openings or releasing, doing some crop tree release. Those are all little openings that bats can use. Riparian zones, so these are places where we've been really careful to leave vegetation along rivers and those are areas that bats use as protective corridors for flying. They are often foraging on insects that are on the water and hatch out of the water. And then they need to dip down into an open water source to get a drink. So they need the protection from predators like owls and other animals that might get them while they're flying out in the open. Skid trails and roads can also be good for that. But we also have some species that forage over the treetops, some of those larger species like the hoary bat. And then we have species like the northern long ear bat and eastern small-footed bat that really specialize in dodging in and out of trees in the understory in a less, a less cluttered forested area. So if we look at that and we zoom out, you can see viewing down into the Champlain Valley here, we have a picture where you can see forested area, you can see open water, and then you can also see these hedgerows that are typical of some of these agricultural areas. And those hedgerows are actually really important when we think about land conversion and habitat conversion and um, development because bats can use those to get from one place to another very safely. Bats have what we call a fission fusion colony structure, and that means if you have, say, 100 bats, those bats won't all necessarily be at the same roost on the same night. They have a whole collection of roosts, a network that they use. One of those may be a primary, really key place, like uh, someone's attic or a really large tree, but then they have a number of secondary sites that they're moving in and out of. And that roost switching can happen every one to five days for a lot of these species but can vary depending on the time of year, where they are in their reproductive cycle. But you can see how bats would need to use these types of connections to get from place to another so that they're not using a lot of energy to fly around those very open spaces where they're vulnerable. And we've also seen that habitat conservation really works for some of these species. Here's a network of different types of conserved land in Heinsberg where we knew there was an Indiana bat colony that we discovered there in 2007, 8, and 9 through some survey work. And money, federal money was used because of the discovery of that species to conserve land for them. A town forest was created, and we've actually gone back there more recently and found out that not only is the bat there, but compared to all the other sites that we've surveyed after white nose syndrome, this one site has a very robust colony. In fact, when we look at our pre-white nose syndrome average colony size in the green box and scatter plot on the or, um, box and whisper plot on the left, you can see that we were really finding large numbers of bats concentrated in trees. I mentioned we had over 300 bats in a single tree. But then after white nose syndrome, we found that with those population declines, we still could find Indiana bats out there, but their colony sizes were greatly diminished until we found this Heinsberg colony in blue. And that colony had counts that were between 100, about 150 and uh, almost 300 bats at each roost that we counted bats at. But bats also use structures. So some of these bats will specialize in using trees to roost in, but little and big brown bats are really the species that we find concentrating in structures, everything from covered bridges to bat houses and even behind people's shutters. And we know that those bat houses are really important for these species, especially after they lose a roost. In this case, we have a great example of a place where bats were roosting in a covered bridge in Cornwall. And in 2017, there was a fire there and the roost burned down. Luckily that was in September 
and there were already some additional bat houses that were placed on posts near the covered bridge. We added some additional bat boxes to the ones that were there, and we found that it looks like bats were actually moving in from the surrounding area. In 2022, after a few of the smaller bat houses were falling over in that flooded area, we installed a more robust and permanent structure, a bat condo, with help from an incredible volunteer and some Nature Conservancy land that we were allowed to use. And we saw again that that population really increased, likely because other bats in the area were moving into that structure. So this is really great for the little brown bat and great news where when we look at volunteers who have um, uh, volunteer counts from across the state, you can see in all these different towns, mostly in the Champlain Valley, that after white nose syndrome, this is all after white nose syndrome, the species has been doing really well. So we see that low population after the disease has really stabilized. And in some cases, some of these colonies are seeing a bit of an uptake in the population. And these are all bats that are living in attics and bat houses, essentially. We also have bats that are roosting in rock crevices, talus, and ledges. So these are the types of places we might look at if there's a solar project being proposed, which would flatten one of these piles. This actually can be really great habitat for uh, bats to use. And you can see two little faces down here in the bottom frame with little noses and ears sticking out. Those are eastern small-footed bats. And I mentioned that most of our cave and, and mine sites that we know about are on private lands. So it's really important that we work with those landowners. And nearly all of the tree roofs that we know about are on private lands and those building roofs as well. So we really depend on that for the conservation of these species. And with that, we'll take a break. All right, Alyssa, I'm gonna jump back into questions. Um, our first question uh, is, is thinking back to white nose syndrome. And is there any data or evidence currently that suggests that recovering bats who have survived um, white nose syndrome are able to pass immunity on to their offspring? Yeah, that's something that we've definitely been partnering on with some researchers right now. We believe so based on the fact that um, when we've collected genetic samples from bats before and after the disease, so bats in the initial population before the declines and then bats who survived, there do appear to be markers that selection is going on. So that means that um, particular genes that code for things like hibernation behavior, immune response and things like that do appear to have been selected for during that, that decline process. So we are hoping that that is something that they're passing along to their young. Great. We just heard about bat houses, so I'm going to move on to the next question here, um, and this is about the roosting behavior. So does does the entire colony go um, from the primary roost to the next roost, or do they split up into separate secondary roost groups? Yeah, great question. Um, no, they don't all move together, and so that's why we call it fission fusion. I sort of think of it like this, this big amoeba with, with arms, the colony. So you might have 100 bats, but 50 are in that main roost, and then the other 50 are sort of scattered through the secondary roost. So they do have associations, individuals with each other, but they aren't all moving together as a group. Great. Um, one question is in terms of um, sharing data with, with you or with Fish and Wildlife about um, where bats are living. So um, one of the attendees has observed several bats living in their shingle-sided home and has many large diameter shagbark hickories on their property along Lake Champlain. So uh, with a discovery like this, is this a site that you would be interested in learning more about? Um, and if so, what's the process for letting you know about it? Yes, we would love to know about that. I love having all those eyes on the ground. So we have some great citizen reporting capabilities on our website. So if you go to vtfishandwildlife.com, I would just type bats into the search window and you can find some reporting forms there. You can report a colony, which is what I would call the bats living under your shingles. And if you see any droppings in there, uh, feel free to email me and um, or I'll see a report come in and I can ask you if you can uh, send some of that that uh, guano, the droppings to us. I can send you a little prepaid package to put a sample in and I can figure out the species from there. Thank you so much. Um, Let's see, well, we had one question about a photo of a bat condo, and I, I don't think we have one in the presentation, unfortunately, today. 
Um, and Terry's pointing out one of our links is not working for the manage my land. Thank you for letting us know. We'll see if we can get that fixed. Um, and lastly, uh, Tracy is wondering about uh, contact information, so we will have Alyssa's contact information up at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, Tracy has some recordings to share with you from Granville. OK, great. Um, that is that's all the questions that have been posted for now. So um, uh, big thanks to Alyssa. Alyssa will still be available to answer some questions potentially, but we're going to switch over um, and for our last section. Um, we're going to turn it over to Jens Hilke from the Community Wildlife Program, um, who's going to connect this back to how we think about land landscapes and, and land use planning. Great, uh, thank you so much, uh, Alyssa. That was excellent. Thank you, really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, uh, so I just wanted to uh, bring up the a little bit more about the Community Wildlife Program. Uh, Dave and I serve uh, are, are the staff for the Community Wildlife Program, and and so uh, we've been hosting these uh, these this webinar series. Uh, we do one every spring and fall. Um, and we provide municipal technical assistance. Uh, so yeah. any of you folks that are serving on conservation commissions, planning commissions, DRBs, we're really happy and, and, and eager to engage your town uh, and to help in any way that we can related to, uh, to anything for land use uh, planning. Uh, so please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, not only do we do these webinars, but we also do presentations in towns and and offer more in-depth technical assistance around town plan rewrites and zoning and subdivision updates. So happy to lean in on whatever project you've got going on. Um, so as we think about uh, bringing bats and, and other rare and endangered species into mm -hmm. our land use planning, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples and I'll begin here with, with Salisbury. Uh, a town in the in the Champlain Valley, um, and <clears throat> and here is their significant natural resources map in the town plan from 2017 to 2025, and you can see that there is uh, there is mention of rare, threatened, and endangered species, and you can see some uh, some of those polygons around the lake, uh, but I really did just want want you to pay special attention to this area here in the middle, if you can see my cursor, uh, where there's there's no mention of, of rare, threatened, and endangered species. Uh, but then when you go on to BioFinder, uh, and that's, uh, that is the, the hub for conservation planning information, and that shows the, the lands and waters most important for ecological function, that's a great first step as you think about uh, land use planning and, and the ecological side of that. Uh, BioFinder is a great first step. It offers this prioritization <clears throat> of what's most important at the landscape scale. So seeing that bigger pattern and also seeing hotspots of biological diversity like rare, threatened, and endangered species. <clears throat> and you can see here on the, the, the Salisbury map that there actually is a, a large polygon right in the middle of town in that area that I had highlighted earlier. Uh, and so when you see things like this in BioFinder, that's your cue to start learning more. Uh, and on the BioFinder website, you would just click around and it would tell you, oh, that's actually a, a rare, threatened, and endangered species. It will not tell you what species that is. Uh, we do protect the names of, of rare, threatened, and endangered species. We show the locations, but not the names. So this is called the Heritage Database. Uh, we are willing to share that information with town conservation commissions and planning commissions. Uh, you would contact us. You can go through us at Community Wildlife Program. We would then contact the Heritage Program. You'd sign a data use agreement, just saying that you won't release the, the names of the species. Uh, and then we would provide that information to you. So this is a this is our, our first uh, our first thought that here in Salisbury. Oh, okay, there's some data missing. Um, but look here, uh, I just zoomed into that uh, that data on the atlas, and you can see that area that I highlighted is is, is absolutely uh, called out for RTE. And here is their their zoning districts. Uh, so you can see that there's uh, low density residential, the yellow. Uh, there's uh, medium density residential, which is that area in, in question. 
And then down to the south, there's high density residential. So the town in its zoning is signaling uh, the the urge to desire, uh, excuse me, the, the desire to develop uh, in those areas at, at pretty substantial densities. Uh, and so there's an obvious conflict here. So I don't have any great solutions. I, I don't have the answer to this story, but I just wanted to flag where in land use, we do see these sorts of conflicts coming up between rare species habitats and uh, and and planning for uh, for development. So this is a place where we need that best quality data. The town needs to make sure they're including the most up to date data in their town plan. And it's also an opportunity to work more with the department on how to come up with a balancing act that's going to work well for these species and also accommodate development for the town. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, the, I just, uh, lastly, I just wanted to show you that in the future land use map, uh, they're calling that a, a real town center. And so not only are they calling for high density or medium density residential in the zoning, but in the future, they really want to make that into the town center. Uh, so the the uh, town center region, they call it an area suitable for additional largely residential development and a growth area for the town. So I think the conflict here is obvious. The resolution is in the details and is working with the department and in working with Alyssa to figure out, okay, what is actually most valuable uh, in terms of the habitats in this area? What areas are most appropriate for development? How do we find that balancing act that's gonna work? Uh, so this is the, the first step in the conversation really is acknowledging this conflict and then beginning to, to, to work on on, on resolution at a much finer scale than these maps. Uh, my next example is really along the same theme, uh, and that's uh, in South Burlington. Um, and so at right is the, uh, the species and community scale from the BioFinder website. At left is the landscape scale. And so you can get a sense of both the larger pattern across South Burlington, where those riparian areas, they're, they're small fragments of forest, and then those streams and rivers are what really links things together in, in the, the forest area that's left in, in South Burlington. Obviously, it's a highly residential uh, um, town. Um, <clears throat> so then I, I put on top now, uh, right, the, the actual uh, the polygons for, for rare, threatened, and endangered species. Uh, and then and now you can see in their zoning map, this is an incredibly complicated uh, regulatory situation. And the pressures on South Burlington to develop, to be a growth center such that they can that we limit sprawl elsewhere in Chittenden County uh, are really intense. So there's a lot of development pressure. So the need for accurate data becomes even more important. And so here's a place where those large circles uh, of, you know, where we flag, uh, hey, there are bats in this area. Those large circles aren't appropriate for as a regulatory layer in and of themselves. That's the flag that tells you something's going on there. But if you were to actually regulate based on that circle, uh, you, you'd run into some problems. Um, so here I'm showing the, the tree canopy in dark green, what's considered herbaceous, uh, you know, a smaller uh, vegetation in uh, that yellow, uh, buildings in red and, and roads in black. And then you can see in, in blue that, that circle. Um, and so again, not all of the area within that circle is critically important bat habitat. And so we need to get, uh, we need to move to finer scale data of exactly what is most important. Again, this is the beginning of a conversation, uh, bringing in Alyssa and other experts in the in the heritage program to, to tell us what's most important, and then the town uh, to wrestle with that information and to figure out, well, okay, how can we focus on those most important areas, uh, particularly the forested areas in South Burlington, as well as some of those riparian corridors. Um, 
So I'm just trying to give you a sense of how when you encounter these rare, threatened, and endangered species data on BioFinder or on the Atlas, it's an opportunity to learn more, to figure out what species uh, your your town is has the, the pleasure of hosting and uh, and how you can do more to, uh, to, to to find that balancing act. All right, so here is our contact information. We do have more time. Feel free to go back to questions for Alyssa. I'm also happy to answer questions, um, but really anxious to keep this conversation going. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah, Dave, uh, feel free. Uh, I can't hear anyone, um, so I will just try and Sorry find... about that. Oh, there you go. I uh, turned off my camera instead of unmuting myself, so we're all making Teams gaffes today. All right, so we're <laughs> going to jump right into questions. Uh, this is from Mike. I'm sort of interpreting, a, a, trying to synthesize a couple questions down into one. So uh, this is for Alyssa. So um, what is your perception of how the public views bats in terms of um, public perception. Are they effective ambassadors for conservation? And how does that impact the conservation strategies for them? Yeah, I would say Vermont really is a, a great place to be doing bat work because I talk with other state representatives from around the U.S. and we do have, I think, great public perception of bats. And that has changed mostly because of white nose syndrome. I think before that they were just seen as pests when they were in your house. And, and now uh, people have some empathy for the species having suffered such traumatic decline. So even people who don't really like bats are still willing to at least not kill them when they need to get them out of their homes. So they use safe eviction methods and things like that. So I, I think they are a great conservation ambassador. Obviously, as Jens mentioned, um, it really is difficult with a species that's using habitat within a couple mile radius um, to figure out the best way to communicate where our areas of concern are and how to outline those because it's such a network of habitat features that they're using. So that's one of the most difficult things probably. Um, but I would say as, as an ambassador, it's gotten people to see maybe where we do have successes and get press on that. It's helped us to show people that it really does work when we conserve habitat and we see the species actually doing well and recovering. And I think those are, those are some good examples that get people maybe more excited about conservation working. Great. Um, I'm going to synthesize two questions into one here. So this question is about um, landscaping or building strategies that we can do as individuals or towns to help support bats. So are there known strategies um, and are they documented well uh, so that they can be shared widely? Yeah, I would, I would say two big ones are one in terms of uh, managing forested land or even your backyard, as long as it's not in danger of falling on your house. If you have a tree that has cavities in it, peeling bark, um, even if it's dead or dying, leave that out there. It's not just good for bats, it's for a whole lot of other different wildlife species from squirrels, um, ground squirrels and flying squirrels to um, bird species that are using cavities for nesting. So those types of features may kind of look ugly to some people <laughs> on their land, but they're actually really important for wildlife. So keep those. And the other one would be managing invasive species and planting native species. So a lot of the insects that bats eat, moths and beetles uh, and, and some of the other um, species are actually pollinating species as well. And so if you're planting things that are native plants that are attracting pollinators, night pollinators especially, those are attracting insects that bats eat. If you are managing for invasive species by removing those, then you're allowing for a larger variety of different insect species to thrive there because invasive species tend not to host as, as good of a diversity of uh, insect species. Next question is from Tina, and that is how transplantable is a colony of bats? So if development was going to happen, um, what would happen to that colony? Yeah, so we look at kind of indirect effects and direct effects. Direct effects are, I mentioned that tree, a whole bunch of bats are in that tree with their young that can't fly yet in the summer. We don't want to cut the tree down while bats are in there because we're directly harming bats in that case. 
But then what if we just wait in the winter and cut down the tree or that whole network we talked about in the fission fusion? What we do know from some research that's been done in terms of forest management is that when bats have that network of roosts, they can tolerate a, a number of those roosts being removed when they're gone for the winter and they'll come back and then they'll find a few replacement roosts. But once you get past a certain threshold, so if you remove, let's say, I, I believe it's about 40% is what the threshold was for northern long ear bats. If you remove more than 40% of those roosts in the network, the whole colony actually um, may, may entirely move off the landscape. And that requires a lot of energy use by the bats to find new roosts. It might disrupt their reproductive success. So that's a type of what we would call indirect take in that situation. So we're still learning more about what the thresholds are for each of these species, but there certainly is an amount that they can tolerate before it really disrupts their behavior in a negative way. Great. So we're going to close out with one question that is a tag team for Alyssa and Jens, um, and it's about wind turbines. So first, how do wind turbines affect bats? And the second part is, can we use BioFinder data to plan where to locate turbines? So we'll start so with Alyssa. I'll, I'll start the first one, yeah. Um, so, uh, and it was, how do, how do they affect bats? Yeah, yes. uh, how, yep. how do they affect bats? Yeah, so wind, wind uh, energy development, the turbines are known to be the largest threat for those migrating species, the long distance migrators, the hoary, silver-haired and eastern red bats. As they fly, they tend to use some of those ridge lines, I think, to navigate. And they actually are very curious about the turbines. And so they'll go right up to them and check them out, almost like they're checking out a tree or something. They'll even land on turbines. So even if they're not coming directly in contact with the blades, they can even be sort of get into that swirling vortex of air and are knocked to the ground. So we know they're a threat to those species. Unfortunately, none of those species are protected as threatened or endangered. Luckily, because the turbines could potentially take listed species as well, even though only one has been documented in, in Vermont so far at any of the operating facilities, um, one little brown bat has been taken that we're aware of. Um, because that's a possibility, they have to get a permit through us to operate. And as part of that permit, they have to um, have some pretty strict criteria they have to adhere to, which is to not have the turbines operating when the wind speeds are low at the time of year when bats are moving through and uh, when temperatures are greater than 50 degrees. So, so when all the conditions are right, that bats will be out and active on the landscape, they essentially have to curtail and stop operation, which is at a wind speeds that are lower anyway, easy for bots to fly and they're making less energy. So they have to abide by those. And they also, um, also have to pay a mitigation fee, which goes to fund all of that maternity colony monitoring. All the numbers that I reported of little brown bats and buildings and all of that volunteer monitoring, the bat houses we give out to people who are evicting endangered bats, all of that is funded through that program. So it's a big offset for a small potential for take. But in the meantime, it's helping those species that aren't protected because they're the ones who are actually most impacted because it could protect the, because it could take an endangered species, we use permitting authority to protect all those species. And there's great research out there that shows that those curtailing um, operations actually greatly reduce the amount of bats that are killed from turbines. Um, and I'll just uh, jump in with a question about using BioFinder data. Yes, that is a great starting place uh, for finding data about where to site wind turbines but you'll really need to learn more about what each of those layers means and, and how to, how to uh, cite turbines based on that data, because all of our largest forest blocks are gonna show up as highest priority at the landscape scale. So then we need to know what that means. And then it's also a question for uh, the Public Service Board of whether that constitutes uh, uh, you know, an important use for people such that it, 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 it's worth the harm to the environment. There's always gonna be those trade-offs. But yes, BioFinder is a, is a great uh, first step for that. And I'm happy to help you interpret that data more. Um, we are a couple minutes uh, late. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Uh, and Alyssa, thank you for sharing your expertise. I, I get so much out of this. I, I really appreciate it. So have a great day, afternoon, everybody. Take care now. Thank you.